Today we continue our series where we're looking at people who had encounters with Jesus. Um, and what I love about today's passage is it, it just demonstrates how, you know, there are always crowds wherever Jesus went. There are always crowds. because People just love being near him. They love listening to what he had to say. They love all that happened when he was there. But today's reading illustrates very clearly that he's not really interested in the crowds. He's interested in the individuals. Um, so that's one of the things today's reading illustrates. But the other thing, now it might, it's, I think it's more than a coincidence that the needs of the two people who encounter Jesus today is a need for healing. And I say this because as a community, we're, we're in a place where there's a lot of need for healing just now. And so maybe this is, this is meant. But anyway, Graham's going to read the passage for us. It's from Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, and reading from verse 21 to the end of verse 43. Quite a long read, so just sit back and imagine. Thank you, Graham. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered round him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just, just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. Amen. Thank you, Graham. So... Here we have Jesus' ministry in full flow. 
He's, he's, he's got large crowds coming to him. It's all going really, really well. And then we have two interruptions. And, and the first interruption is a man called Jairus. He's the leader of a local synagogue. Well, that's not why he's interrupting Jesus. He's interrupting Jesus because he's absolutely desperate. His little girl is very, very ill. Um, and I can imagine, as any father would, he's, he's, he's tried everything. He's been to the local doctors. He's tried all the local remedies. He's, you know, all the things that are there he's tried and nothing's worked. And so, and then he hears that Jesus is here and, and that he, he, you know, he is a, a bit of a healer. And so this is his last chance. And so he says to Jesus, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And I love the way that immediately Jesus stops all that he's doing and he goes with them because he cares. He's not so much bothered by the crowds. He's bothered by individuals. And notice how the crowd follow. I mean, why did they follow? Maybe they're curious. Oh, what's going to happen? I don't know. But the crowd follows them. Big crowd. And it's while they're all hurrying on their way to Jairus' house. We don't know how far away Jairus' house is, by the way. But it's while they're all hurrying on their way that there's a second interruption. And this time, we're not told the woman's name. She's an unknown woman, but she also is desperate. We're told she's been suffering from internal bleeding for 12 years. So that's 12 years where every day is full of stress and utter exhaustion. Where she's run ragged with this thing. And we're also told she spent all her savings on doctors, and nothing has worked. It's just got worse and worse and worse. So she too thinks of Jesus as her only hope, her last chance. And notice how she doesn't want to make a fuss. She doesn't want to draw attention to herself. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But she simply makes her way through the crowd and then thinks, if I just touch his cloak, that's all I need to do. And that's what she does. And straight away she feels different. And she feels whole again, and she knows she's been healed. And no doubt she's then hoping, I'll be able to slip away again, and no one will know. But to her dismay, Jesus stops and declares to all the crowd, who touched me? <laughs> and we see that his disciples are a bit puzzled by this, because everybody's touching him, and it's a huge crowd, and they're all jostling him and want to be near him and all this sort of stuff. And I can imagine Jairus is thinking, who cares who touched you? You know, why are we stopping? My wee girl's ill. But nevertheless, Jesus stops, and he says, no, I could feel the, 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 the healing power, I could feel the Holy Spirit's power leaving me there. Someone has touched me. Someone has been healed. And the woman, you know, he's looking around, and the woman thinks, oh. <laughs> and we're told, trembling with fear, she falls at his feet. Now, why is she trembling with fear? I mean, the reason she's trembling with fear is the same reason she doesn't want a fuss made, okay? The same reason she doesn't want anybody to know. And that's because, according to the Jewish purity laws, if you are bleeding the way that she is bleeding, you are ritually impure, which means you cannot go to the synagogue and you cannot go to the temple and you cannot even mix with polite company. So for 12 years, she's been ostracized. She's had to keep her distance. For 12 years, she's, she's lived her struggle in, in isolation. I mean, can you imagine that? And the very fact she's in that crowd is problematic for her because she shouldn't be in the crowd. Because she shouldn't be touching other people. She's ritually impure. And now Jesus is calling her out. Who touched me? So that's why she's trembling with fear. And we're told she falls at his feet and it all comes pouring out. All the 12 years of misery comes pouring out plus the glorious news that she's been healed. And I wonder what she expects Jesus is going to say. 
Because, you know, if he was a proper rabbi who knew his laws and all that stuff, surely he's going to say, how dare you? Have you no shame? How dare you? So that no wonder she's trembling with fear. She's thrown himself at his mercy. But what he does say to her is actually something beautiful. And I imagine it might have been a surprise to a lot of people listening, but it wouldn't have been a surprise to those people who knew Jesus and knew what he was like. Because he says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. So it's a bit of a wow moment now. Everybody's going, wow. She's just been healed just by touching his cloak. Wow, he just said that. She can go in peace. She's been healed from her suffering. Wow. And it's just at that moment, when everybody's trying to take in what's just happened, that there's another interruption. Except this time, it's not the news anybody there wants to hear. Especially Jairus. We're told some men come from his home. They've set out, presumably a while. They've taken a while to get there. And their news is just the worst news ever. Your little girl has died. Don't bother him anymore. It's too late. And I can just imagine the, the, the mood of the crowd going from utter wonder and joy and euphoria to chew, to utter dismay. It's like a dark cloud descends on everybody. And, you know, like the show is now over. And, and I can imagine there's, cra- there's questions whizzing around people's heads, especially Jairus' head. So, oh, why did he have to stop? Why did he have to ask who touched me? I mean, surely all that could have waited. But Jesus, he knows all this. And he says to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. Hmm. So the crowd's gone now. The show's over. And it's just Jesus and his disciples. And he even takes just a few of his disciples. He just takes Peter and James and John, who are sort of his inner circle, and they go with Jairus, and they wind their way up to Jairus' home. And by the time they get there, the news is out. The neighbors know. So there's all the things that happen when someone dies. There's weeping, there's wailing, there's mourning. There's a whole... And I'm sure people are saying, I wonder, where's the father? Where's the father? His poor girl's dying. Where's the father? And some of them say, oh, he went off chasing some faith healer. And then the father comes, and he's brought the faith healer with him. And everybody's thinking, well, sorry, you're far too late. Your chance is gone. And then to make things worse, Jesus starts saying that the girl isn't dead. Well, obviously she's dead. Why is he saying she's not dead, that she's just asleep? I mean, how stupid, how insensitive. Who does he think he is? And yet we know, remember Jesus doesn't care about the crowd. He cares about the individual. We know that he's undeterred. And he beckons to the mum and dad. Come on. And he gets Peter and James and John. And they all go up to the wee girl's room. And he goes up. And he doesn't do this great big ceremony with laying on of hands and invoking this and invoking that. He just takes her by the hand and says, little girl, get up. And she does. It's a lovely story. But it's not just a story. I think we can learn so much from this. About, well, we can learn about how Jesus sees people. But more importantly for us right now, we can, we can learn a lot about what we mean when we're talking about divine healing or miraculous healing. Notice how there is no formula. There's no ritual. You know, sometimes people say, oh, well, for healing, we have to use these words, and we have to do this, and it has to be done in the right order, and if we do that, it's a bit like a formula, isn't it? It's a bit like cooking, a, making a cake or something. Not that I'm a baker. But, you know, people think, oh, well, you just, I wish I knew how to do that. Do it. But Jesus doesn't follow a formula at all, and neither should we. In, in Jairus' case, he, 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 he wants Jesus to lay hands and do all that sort of stuff. But it turns out that's not necessary. In, in the case of the woman, 
she doesn't, Jesus doesn't even know that she's there until she touches his cloak. And if you actually look at all the different accounts, and there are so many different accounts of healing in the Gospels, you'll find there's no formula. You'll find that sometimes Jesus does lay his hand on someone and ask for them to be healed. You'll find other times he goes, he, he's even more elaborate. He gets some mud <laughs> and he, he makes a paste and puts it on the blind man's eye so he does... He, he totally goes into, into a method there. But other times he just says the word. No contact needed. And still other times he gives the order for someone who's at home to be healed. So he doesn't even see them. There's no formula. In fact, if you look at all these cases, then the only thing they have in common, the only ingredient that they all share, is faith. So in, in the case of the daughter, it's her father's faith. And I don't know if you remember the case of the four men, the friends who lowered their, mat, their friend down through. It's their faith. And in the case of the woman, it's her faith. One thing they all have in common is either an act of faith or a prayer of faith. But this, of course, raises other problems for us because sometimes people pray in faith and still their loved one is not healed and we probably all know of, of times when that's happened or we've heard of times when that's happened you pray and you pray your very best prayer and the person you love isn't healed so why does God heal some people and not heal other people? So here are some of my thoughts. And you probably heard me voicing these before, but I've collected them all together as much as I can. First thought is, what do we actually mean by healing? I mean, is there such a thing as perfect health? particularly in a fallen world. Sometimes we pray and a person experiences healing. Other times the person is not healed. But what they are given is something very, very precious. They are given more time, quality time, with their loved ones. They're still ill, but they're given more time than they thought they would get. And still other times, a person is healed, but only partially healed. I know this from personal experience, because my wife, Lindsay, about 45 years ago, she had a really bad shoulder. Uh, sorry, not shoulder. She's got a bad shoulder now. She had a really bad elbow. And we, it was prayed for, and, and it was healed. But it still troubles her today. So she wasn't perfectly healed. So what do we mean when we say Healing. What do we mean? And then there's the thing we were talking about earlier. There's the timing issue. When we ask God for something, his answer can be yes, his answer can be no, his answer can be just wait. Jairus had to wait. He didn't know why he had to wait, but he had to wait. Other people have to wait much, much longer than Jairus did. And yet, despite all these things, we have to admit that despite our prayer, some people are never healed in this life. And when that happens, all we can do is actually put our trust in God. All we can do is trust the God who we know loves them and cares about them more than we do. That's all we can do. And trust that there's a reason which we might not be aware of, but God is aware of why they're not being healed yet. Trust him. We may never know, not in this life, but there will come a time when we will be able to ask him. And he will tell us. But we need to trust him. And it's when you're willing to trust God, despite all that's going on, that you begin to experience this thing that's called the peace of God, which is beyond understanding. That means it's the peace of God which defies all reason and logic. It's beyond our understanding, but we still experience it. 
And if you were here on Tuesday night when we had our prayer gathering and our focus was on healing and there were lots of prayers offered for healing, we all experienced that sense of peace that night. It's the sort of sense of peace you get when you know God's got this. God's got this. I'm sharing this with God and he's got this. And I trust him. We're not quite sure what's going to happen, but God's got this. So here's a question for us all, and it's, it's really quite a big question, particularly when we're talking about healing, is are you desperate for healing, or do you know someone who you're desperate for them to be healed? Someone like Jairus, someone like the woman. Do you know, do you know someone who's desperate? If you do, can I encourage you simply to pray? Pray that prayer in faith, trusting that God loves them and God cares about them and God can heal them. And if you struggle praying that prayer, because sometimes you're so worked up about something, you find it hard to pray that prayer yourself. Find someone who can pray it for you. I mean, even today, if you want to, to, to if you're, you're really struggling to pray about something, you can come and there'll be people sitting over there who'd be willing to share that with you in confidence and pray with you. Pray. Pray knowing that what you're doing is not magic, it's not a formula, it's not do A and you'll get B. It's, it's an act of trust. You're, it, it, you're sharing something with someone you know loves you and cares about you. So just pray. See what happens. Let's just take a few moments in silence. What have I learned today? What has God been saying to me? What am I going to do about it? Let's just spend some time. It's just us and God. Let's do it now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that we have heard about and read today. And we thank you that you care about us. Whoever we are, you care about us. Enough to stop and listen and heal. And our prayer is that we would experience, we'd be aware of your presence with us in the days to come. And that we would be able to experience the healing presence of a God who loves us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.